Out of all the stories in the Bible, probably the one that I misunderstood the most was the Transfiguration. Today, we're going to talk about the Feast of the Transfiguration. Thanks to our friends at Fish Eaters, we're going to go through to see if we could understand the spiritual and temporal significance of this amazing feast day. Stick around. Greetings, listeners of the Latin Prayer Podcast, and welcome back for another episode. Your dedication to the podcast and daily rosary prayers is truly appreciated. As we delve into today's content, I encourage you to check out the show notes for the daily rosary links and share this podcast with your friends and family. Remember Pope St. Pius X once said, if there were one million families praying the rosary every day, the entire world would be saved. Together, we can play our part in making that a reality. I value your input, so feel free to share any questions or suggestions for future episodes via email at latinprayerpodcast at gmail.com. Your engagement matters immensely. Whether you're listening on YouTube, Spotify, or iTunes, hitting the like button and leaving a comment is the easiest free way for you to show support to the podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us on YouTube as over the next six months, I am making a serious push to grow the Latin Prayer Podcast YouTube channel. More so than YouTube, it is my goal to grow the Latin Prayer Podcast Patreon community. Doing so would allow me to produce a higher caliber content on a more full-time basis. I cannot do this without your help. So if you're in a position and you are eager to play a pivotal role in propelling the Latin Prayer Podcast to new heights and shaping its future, I invite you to become a patron on my Patreon page. I have crafted four tiers, each offering unique benefits tailored to enhance your experience with more benefits to come. We have the Primus Oratio, which is the first prayer tier to become a basic supporter, helping keep the podcast running and continuing its growth. Step two is the Fidelis Dei, which is faithful to God tier, and you become a prayer partner able to submit prayer requests and special intentions for our Latin prayer podcast community to pray for, and I will announce those prayer requests on the show so that other people will hear it and be able to pray along with us. By joining the third tier, the Sancta Ecclesia, the Holy Church tier, you become a faithful follower, granting you access to the MP3 library for all the Latin Prayer podcast episodes. And finally, the Vox Angelorum, Voice of Angels tier, offers you the title of an angelic advocate, gifting you with an original quarterly prayer card available as a digital download. Your support directly contributes to the creation of meaningful content. And you have my promise to continue to improve your Patreon and podcast experience. Together we can spread the beauty of traditional Latin prayers and customs of the Catholic Church for the greater glory of God. So I thank you again for tuning in. Now let's get started with today's episode. If you would like the full text for today's episode, I will include the link to the Fish Eaters page in the show notes. The Feast of the Transfiguration Recall the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I beheld therefore in the vision of the night, and lo, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and he came even to the Ancient of Days. And they presented him before him, and he gave him power and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, tribes, and tongues shall serve him. His power is an everlasting power that shall not be taken away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Today, forty days before the exaltation of the Holy Cross, we celebrate the realization of that prophecy when Moses, representing the law, and Elias, Elijah, representing the prophets, two men who had special visions of God, appear in glory with Jesus on Mount Tabor, which is Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. There, Saints Peter, James, and John see the divine uncreated light shine forth from our Lord, who told them previously that he must die and be resurrected. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1-8 to And after six days Jesus taketh unto him Peter and James and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elias talking with him. 
And Peter answering said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And as he was yet speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And lo, a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the disciples, hearing, fell upon their face, and they were very much afraid. And Jesus came and touched them, and said to them, Arise, and fear not. And they, lifting up their eyes, saw no one but only Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Christ, as the temple, who would be raised up three days after being torn down, shows that he is indeed the one in whom the glory dwells. As the creed says, Deum de Deo, Lumen de Lumine, Deum Verum de Deo Vero, God from God, Light from Light, True God of True God. Just before this amazing event, Christ heard St. Peter's profession of faith and gave him authority as the first pope. Just after this event, he revealed that he would go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. Of significance to this feast is what it reveals about true Judaism and its fulfillment in the Catholic faith. Taken from the Catholic Encyclopedia, false Judaism had rejected the Messiah, and now true Judaism represented by Moses and Elias, the law and the prophets, recognized and adored him, while for the second time God the Father proclaimed him his only begotten and well-loved Son. St. John Chrysostom writes more about the appearance of Moses and Elias in his homilies on the Gospel of Matthew. But wherefore doth he also bring forward Moses and Elias? One might mention many reasons, and first of all this, because the multitudes said he was some Elias, some Jeremiah, some one of the old prophets. He brings the leaders of his choir, that they might see the difference even hereby between the servants and the Lord, and that Peter was rightly commended for confessing him son of God. But besides that, one may mention another reason also, that because men were continually accusing him of transgressing the law and accounting him to be a blasphemer, as appointing himself a glory which belonged not to him, even the fathers, and were saying, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. And again, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God that both the charges might be shown to spring from envy, and he be proved not liable to either, and that neither is his conduct a transgression of the law, nor his calling himself equal to the Father an appropriation of glory not his own. He brings forward them who had shown out in each of these respects, Moses, because he gave the law, and the Jews might infer that he would not have overlooked its being trampled on, as they supposed, nor have shown respect to the transgressor of it and the enemy of its founder. Elias, too, for his part, was jealous for the glory of God. And were any man an adversary of God and calling himself God, making himself equal to the Father, while he was not what he said, and had no right to do so, he was not the person to stand by and hearken unto him. And one may mention another reason also with those which have been spoken of. Of what kind, then, is it? To inform them that he hath power both of death and life, is ruler both above and beneath. For this cause he brings forward both him that had died and him that never yet suffered this. But the fifth motive, for it is a fifth besides those that have been mentioned, even the evangelist himself hath revealed. Now what was this? To show the glory of the cross, and to console Peter and the others in their dread of the passion, and to raise up their minds. Since, having come, they by no means held their peace, but spake, it is said, 
of the glory which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem, that is, of the passion and the cross, for they so call it always. St. John Chrysostom, in a continuation of the homily above, explains the deepest lesson of the transfiguration, what it foreshadows for our own glorification at the end of time, if he deigns to save us. But if we will, we also shall behold Christ, not as they, Saints Peter, James, and John, then on the mount, but in far greater brightness. For not thus shall he come hereafter. For whereas then, to spare his disciples, he discovered so much only of his brightness as they were able to bear. Hereafter he shall come in the very glory of the Father, not with Moses and Elias only, but with the infinite host of the angels, with the archangels, with the cherubim, with those infinite tribes, not having a cloud over his head, but even heaven itself being folded up. For as it is with the judges, when they judge publicly, the attendants drawing back the curtains show them to all. Even so, then likewise, all men shall see him sitting, and all the human race shall stand by, and he will make answers to them by himself. And to some he will say, Come, ye blessed of my father, for I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. To others, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will set thee over many things. And again passing an opposite sentence, to some he will answer, Depart into the everlasting fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. And to others, O thou wicked and slothful servants! And some he will cut asunder, and deliver to the tormentors. But others he will command to be bound hand and foot, and cast into the outer darkness. And after the axe the furnace will follow, and all out of the net, that is east away, will fall therein. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun, or rather more than the sun. But so much is said, not because their light is to be so much and no more, But since we know no other star brighter than this, he chose by the known example to set forth the future brightness of the saints. Since on the mount too, when he says, he did shine as the sun, for the same cause he did so speak. For that the comparison did not come up to his light, the apostles showed by falling down. For had the brightness not been unalloyed, but comparable to the sun, they would not have fallen, but would easily have borne it. The righteous therefore will shine as the sun, and more than the sun in that time, but the sinners shall suffer all extremities. Then there will be no need of records, proofs, witnesses, for he who judges himself all, both witness and proof and judge, for he knows all things exactly, for all things are naked and opened unto his eyes. No man will there appear rich or poor, mighty or weak, wise or unwise, bond or free. But these masks will be dashed in pieces, and the inquiry will be into their works only. For if in our courts, when anyone is tried for usurpation or murder, whatever he may be, whether governor or consul, or what you will, all these dignities fleet away, and he that is convicted suffers the utmost penalty, much more will it be so there. Therefore, that this may not be so, let us lay aside our filthy garments, let us put on the armor of light, and the glory of God will wrap us around. And speaking of garments, note how in the biblical accounts of Christ's showing his glory during the transfiguration, even his garments gave off light. God reveals his glory in created things, see the book of nature, and the more obvious manifestation of this fact during the transfiguration points to the renewal of all creation, the new heaven and new earth spoken of in the apocalypse not just the righteous, rational souls, which will happen at the end of time. The next section on the Fish Eaters page is that of customs. 
So I'll just read to you a little bit, but I won't go through all of the recipes that she's included because I think you can go online and take a look at these themselves, but I'll just read the beginning section of the customs. This feast has a sort of first fruits theme, as do other early August feasts like Lammas and the Feast of the Assumption, and once included the blessing of grapes and wheat, and this is still the case in some of the Eastern liturgies. She goes on to mention that below are a couple of super simple grape recipes for you to try. You can use either green or purple grapes for either, but they should be seedless or at least de-seeded. So she has one recipe for roasted grapes, another one for grape sorbet, and then she has a trickier recipe that uses not the fruit, but rather the leaves of grape vines, which is Greek dolmades. And you can't beat that, seriously. If you've never had dolmades, you have to to try it. Uh, having grown up in the Middle East from the age of 1 to 10, I grew up in Dubai, and dolmades were just a very normal growing up experience, and they are delicious. If you ever get a chance to, never mind making them, you just get a chance to try them, I would highly encourage you to do so. She also has some suggestions to music that is relevant to the deep meaning of the day. There is a 4th century hymn by Prudentus, and it is sung at Vespers and at Matins, and she's got the audio and the text for both of those. She concludes with a reading, which is Sermon 51 by Pope St. Leo the Great, which is AD 461. So this is not Pope St. Leo the 13th, this is Pope St. Leo the Great. And I believe he has, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sections of his reading. And I'm not going to read it all to you because it's rather lengthy and this podcast is already past the 15 minute mark. But what I will do for you is I will summarize each of the sections. And as I mentioned before, the link to the Fish Eaters page will be in the show notes so you can go in and you can read Pope St. Leo the Great's sermon yourself. So I will just summarize each of the sections for you. So Pope St. Leo the Great in the first section explains that with the Feast of the Transfiguration, that Jesus Christ, the Savior, taught his disciples through words and miracles, revealing both his divinity and humanity. Peter's revelation that Jesus is the Son of God established him as a rock for the church. Section 2. To balance their understanding, our Lord predicts his suffering, death, and resurrection, leading St. Peter to resist these events. Christ emphasized self-denial and endurance, taking St. Peter and others to a mountain, revealing his divine glory, showing the unity of Godhead and humanity. In section 3, he explains, the transfiguration aimed to prepare the apostles for our Lord's passion and reveal his hidden glory. St. Peter's desire to stay on the mountain was met with Jesus' reminder of the necessity of suffering before glory. Section 4 is, Moses and Elijah represented both the law and the prophets, confirming Christ's fulfillment of both covenants. This reinforced the unity of Scripture and Christ's authority. Section 5, St. Peter's exuberance led him to suggest building tabernacles. Our Lord's silence indicated the priority of his sacrificial death over immediate glory. In section 6, he explains, a bright cloud and a voice affirmed Christ as God's beloved Son. This emphasized his divinity and the unity between the Father and the Son. In section 7, he explains, The Father's voice urged listening to Christ, who embodies truth, life, and redemption. Believers are encouraged to endure suffering and fear not, as Christ conquered death. And finally, he concludes with section 8. The message extends beyond the apostles, instructing the whole church, us. There is but one way forward. Catholics should embrace the cross as Christ's humility and triumph promise eternal life. I want to thank you all for tuning in to another episode. I especially want to thank our patrons, 
Our newest patron is Manuel. So thank you, Manuel, for joining our Patreon community. Your support is greatly appreciated. And I would like to conclude today's episode by asking you to join me in praying a Pater Noster, Ave Maria, and Gloria for all of our patrons, for their family members, and for their intentions. So please join me. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et demite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos demitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationum, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So until our next episode, may God love all of you, and Our Lady keep you.